Praise the Lord and welcome to the broadcast of the Nazarene Baptist Church. Sometimes it's not enough to be reminded that Jesus hasn't left you or forgotten you. We need to declare it over ourselves, over others. No matter the season you may find yourself in, no matter the depths of darkness you're wading through, you can join him in declaring the truth that God is light upon your feet, whether or not you can see the next step, that God is your strength, even though the weight of life seems to be crushing you down. And that when your job, your marriage, your relationship, your health feels like it's coming to a dead end, there is only one God that can make dead things live again. These are his promises and they're the only thing you need to declare over your life. So as you step into this next season or this next moment, you can declare that God's not done with you. He's just getting started. You can declare that the good work that he has started in you, he will surely complete it. You can declare that the same God that parted the seas goes before you, goes behind you. You can declare these promises over your life, over your family's life, over the people passing on the street. You can declare these truths over every circumstance, over every season of your life. You can declare that every day belongs to him and every new breath belongs to him. Because we have the power of a living God living inside of us. And this is our declaration. Sunday School, Sundays at 8.30 a.m. Virtual Bible Study, Wednesday at 7 p.m. Join the Prayer Call, Mondays and Fridays at 6 a.m. To include your prayer request on the call, please send them to the email address care at nazarenebaptist.org no later than Wednesday for the following week. All prayer requests submitted prior to the calls as you won't be able to submit your requests during the call. How can we pray for you? If you have a prayer request, please send them to care at nazarenebaptist.org. Happy birthday to all of our April born members. We have three ways to give. You can give your offering by mail to our P.O. Box. You can give your offering through Tithely to Nazarene Baptist Church. Or you can text GIVE to 833-402-2068. Dear Lord, as we come confidently to the throne of grace in full surrenderance, we pray that we receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Lord, help your children as we face life, sickness, grief, loss of employment, financial struggles, 
suicidal thoughts, broken relationships, poor leadership, inflation, homelessness, mass shootings, and monumental disasters. Father, help us as we endure the destruction of our church and grant us patience as we await the reconstruction of Nazarene Baptist Church. Empower our pastor and keep him close to you during this time. Keep your hands on the first family, each ministry, and help us to put you first in all things. Remind us, Lord, that you have already overcome the world, including our struggles. We place this prayer at the altar and confidently await our breakthroughs, our blessings, and more of you. It is in your son Jesus' most precious name that we pray. Amen. 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 Sometimes I don't want to try Try to move on When it seems there's nothing left Left Lord, I need you to step in Give me a second wind Lord, with your help, I know that I will win. I will press even when I am distressed. I will press even when life's a It is my 
Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As we go into the Word of God today, this passage where Jesus reveals the greatest of all commandments, he's having a philosophical discussion with the lawyer. The lawyer is placing the Messiah under scrutiny and looking for loopholes. But Jesus responds with an insightful and timeless lesson. Are you ready? Let's talk about love. Have you ever found yourself saying these four words? Lord, stand by me. Or have you ever quietly prayed and said, Lord, be with me. Or perhaps, Lord, give me strength. You know, it's amazing how just four simple words could speak so much value. You see, I've realized something as I've grown both in age and spiritual maturity, that my need for the Lord has increased. My need for him to be with me has increased. My need for the Lord to stand by me has increased. And here's why I have such a need for Jesus. You see, I need Jesus because I have tried to do things on my own, but I've been met with the harsh reality that on my own, it's impossible to win. It's impossible to gain a breakthrough and it's impossible to have peace of mind if the Lord is not with me. You see, I need Jesus because there are strongholds in my family that I can't break with my own power. And so I need the strength and the might that's in the blood of Jesus Christ. I need him because life is complicated. I have problems, problems that I care not to discuss with anyone because people will often judge before they reveal their own struggles. So I desperately need the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the only one who has ever given me an open invitation. Like in Psalms 55 verse 22, where the Bible reads to cast your burdens upon the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. So you see, I need him because I cannot save myself. I cannot redeem myself. I cannot deliver myself. And there sure isn't any other human being on this planet who can offer me redemption or salvation, or even eternal life like Jesus Christ can. So I have to be honest with you. At the times when things are really rough, I find myself just saying and praying four simple words over and over again. And that is, be with me, Jesus. Be with me, Lord. At times when I'm tempted, I find myself quietly praying, Lord, give me strength. Give me the strength, Jesus. And if you can relate to what I'm saying to you today, then I encourage you to stand, child of God. Stand firm in the word of God. And take those things that weighs you down, that are very weighty on your spirit, Take those very burdens that slump your shoulders down and just hand them over to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now let us pray. Dear Lord Jesus, your word in Psalm 42 and verse 1 reminds us this. As the deer pants for the water brooks, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul does need you, Lord. You see, there are so many problems that I cannot overcome on my own. So I need your strength. I need your strength and your power to help me to overcome the obstacles that I face. I need you to stand by me, Lord. I, I need you in my heart and in my mind and in my emotions. 
So your word in Isaiah 40 verse 29 says that, that, that he gives power to the faint. And to him who has no might, he increases strength. So it's in you that I, have, I can have victory. And it's only through you that I can be a victor. Because without you, Lord Jesus, there are giants that I can't fight with in my own strength. There are situations that are just too much for me to handle by myself. So that's why I asked you to stand by me, oh God. Whether I'm in a storm or in a valley or in the shadow of death, God be with me. Whether I'm in a fiery furnace or in a lion's den, I pray that you would raise up a standard. When the enemy comes at me like a flood, Lord, I look to you. I look to your saving grace, God. So when the devil attempts to attack me, I will hold on to this word that you will keep me from evil and that you will preserve my life. You will not allow any strongholds to overcome me. Though my problems may be daunting, I am at peace knowing that you are with me because you have promised that you would never leave me nor will you ever forsake me. So even when the odds are against me, I will count on you, Lord. Whether I'm in the lion's den or in the eye of the storm, God, you are so faithful to me. And I believe that you will be with me and that you will protect me because great is your faithfulness towards me. Hallelujah. God, may you be glorified now forever and ever. And it is in your name, the name, the majestic name of the Lord Jesus Christ that I pray to you this morning. Amen. Amen. And amen. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you as we gather together on this joyous Sunday morning to celebrate the goodness of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Today marks a special occasion as we not only come together in worship, but to also rejoice in the blessings of God. As we reflect, let us give thanks for the countless moments of grace, mercy, and love that has sustained us. Through every challenge we face, and every triumph we've celebrated. We have been held in the loving arms of our Heavenly Father. His faithfulness endures and His promises remain steadfast. So today, let us approach our time of worship with a heart full of gratitude, open to the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Together, let us lift up our voices in praise and of adoration and thanksgiving for the abundant blessings that has been bestowed upon us. Our brothers and sisters, today our scriptural lesson comes from the gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 22, beginning at verse 35 down through verse 40. I'll be reading from the King James translation of scripture, and there you'll notice these words. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Speaking today simply from the subject of love without a clause. Did you know that at least 50% of the wars that have been fought in this world have been fought by religious people over religion and how they perceive God? Jesus received more persecution through religious people than he did anybody else. In our text, he is up against this kind of scrutiny 
And as he is trying to teach and minister, there comes in the crowd a lawyer. And the lawyer begins to drill him about his philosophy, about theology. This morning, I'm going to teach you something, hopefully, that if I can get it in you, it's going to give you a whole different perspective, not only on this scripture, but on the scriptures that come after it, which are much more common. So the lawyer says to him, you know, what are the laws? What are the greatest laws? And Jesus says, read it for yourself. So he takes it and he starts reading it and he says that you love the Lord thy God with all your heart and with all thy soul and spirit. And that you love your neighbor as yourself. And he's absolutely right. Later in the scriptures, you'll see where Jesus says these two are the greatest commandments because they embody everything. Everything is comprised on two commandments. Let's stop right there. Jesus says that these two commandments encapsulates all of the others. So if we get these two right, we get credit for the whole test. Now that's a pretty good deal. Now you know you're getting ready for the end of the year exam. And watch this. And the teacher says, I got 175 questions. But if you get these two right, you get the credit for the whole 175. Now that's a pretty good deal, isn't it? That's what's being said right here. If you get these two things right, everything else is pretty cool. Not because I overlooked the other ones, but these encapsulates the premise through which all the others are talking about. So what are they? We got to get these two right. He says, number one, that you love the Lord thy God. Wait a minute. You mean after all these ceremonial washings and cleansings and Feast of weeks and feast of unleavened bread. What I can wear and what I can't wear. What I can, where I can go, what I can build, what I can buy, what I can't covet my neighbor. All of the descriptions of criteria that bring about righteousness in the scripture. And the first and most important thing to God is that you love him. Wow. Whether you washed your hands or not, or whether you bow prostrate or not, or whether you mix fabrics or not, or whether you did everything right or not. God says above everything else, the most important thing to me is that you love the Lord, thy God with all thy heart, not part of it with all thy mind with all thy soul, with all thy understanding. I did not know that love was that important. Or are we often taught that love can be legislated? You see, God commands us to love him. He doesn't just beat around the bush about it. Don't we wish that we could do that? Like, I command you to love me. Now, wouldn't that be cool just to look at somebody and say, I command you to love me. <laughs> God says, I command you. Now, wouldn't that fix some marriages right now? Wouldn't that solve some problems in your house right now? Wouldn't that change parents and children's relationships right now? Wouldn't that fix you and your sister or your brother right now? If you could just command it to be like go to work Monday morning and walk into the office and say I command all of y'all to love me wouldn't that be wonderful you see that's what God does he commands us to love him but he's specific watch this he says with all of your heart with all of your soul with all of your mind with all of your understanding I want you to love me he says that's the most important thing. 
He says, love me. That's the most important thing. But Lord, I haven't always done right. I've made some mistakes. I've I've had some sin. I've had some weaknesses in my life. He says, look, don't focus on what's wrong with you. (laughs) Hallelujah. In a world of thou shall not, the priority is on a thou shall. Oh, y'all don't hear what I'm saying to you today. In a world full of thou shall not, the priority here is on a thou shall. Because God says, if you get the shall right, I don't have to worry about the shall not. If you stop approaching God as if he's a police officer about to arrest you when you go over the speed limit, we could move beyond the negativity to the positivity. If you get positive and get this right, then you won't break the law. Not because I'm going to arrest you, but because he so loved me. He says, I want you to stop focusing on what you got wrong and getting lost in what you get right. I don't, he says, I want you to love me with all of your heart and with all of your mind and with and with your soul. So love epitomizes what the commandments talk about. He says, I want the priority to be loving me with everything. Look at what a big command that is. Have you ever loved anything, anyone, including God, with your all? All your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your understanding. God says, I challenge you to discover a hundred percent love before you die, to know what it is to give all of yourself. Can you imagine what we might discover through the all? You know, I often hear, I'll give up everything to follow you. But the reality is that some wouldn't even give up a tuna fish sandwich. But God says, love the Lord thy God with your with all of your heart, all of your mind, and all of your soul. And then he says, the second commandment is that you love your neighbor as yourself. Uh-oh. You know the love of God constrains us. If you don't have the love of God, you'll go anywhere, do anything. You can just be anybody. But when you have love for God and the love of God, it constrains us. No matter what your mood or feelings or attitude may be, love will always ground you and pull you back into the fold. You see, so many people show their Christianity through how they dance or how they shout or even speak in tongues. But if you do all of that and have not love, Paul says you're nothing. And I think he's right. So love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy mind and with all thy soul. And then he says the second commandment is that you love your neighbor as yourself. So I don't have to say thou shall not steal. Because if you love me like you love you, you wouldn't steal from me. Because you love me too much to treat me like you treat me. Imagine how your personal relationship would change. If you love the people in your life like you love yourself. Wouldn't it be amazing? If you were as forgiving of them as you are of you. And isn't it funny? How people who need forgiveness don't often give it. Isn't it funny how how people can need you to understand their quirks but they're unwilling to understand yours. Isn't it funny how people who who want tolerance don't want you, don't want to tolerate you. You see, if you're going to ask me to tolerate you, then it's demonstrated by tolerating me. 
I can't accept you being different. I can accept that. I can accept you being different. But you can't seem to accept me being different. And the reality is that we always want to get more than we're willing to give. So the second scripture obliterates selfishness. In other words, you can't be selfish if you love your neighbor as you love yourself. You just can't do it. Maturity is supposed to make you less selfish. But some people got stuck and they never learned to love anybody. Nowhere close like you love yourself. And so if you're going to break through the bondage, you have to learn how to love yourself because people who love themselves are much easier to love and easier to be around than people who don't even like themselves. Whatever it is, whatever is up with me, watch this, whatever is up with me, when you come into my circle, you become connected to it. So in other words, so if I was crazy before you came in, you understand what I'm saying. Now, if, if, if I'm a self-hater, guilty, complex, insecurity, and you come up and get connected in all of that, and now you are a part of me. The fight that I was having with me, I now get to have with you. So the healthiest people to love are the people who love themselves. So the second commandment Jesus says, these are the two priorities, loving God and loving your neighbor as you love yourself. Because how this relates to the elephant in the room and everything else is what are your priorities? What are the core values through which you let people in or even let God in or anybody in? Like if you don't make a certain amount of money, I can't fool with you. If you're a Democrat or if you're a Republican or who did you vote for or what do you believe about the Godhead or even how were you even baptized or even do you even wear pants? See, we can examine people, but what are your priorities? God says that you love the Lord thy God with all your heart, soul and mind and that you love thy neighbor as you love yourself. Let's go a little deeper. Watch this. He legislates love. In other words, he commands you to love. Ooh, I could spend all day right there. See, if you command me to do something, that means I can do it because it wouldn't be fair for you to command me to do something that I cannot do. So if he commands me to do it, then it must be within my power to accomplish it. Because it wouldn't be just to command me to do something that I cannot do. So that means that love is controllable. He commands it. He legislated love. He says, love me. He says, and this is how you love me. And, and, and what I like about God is that God tells you how to love him without any guessing. You see, most people want you to guess how to love them. But God comes right out and says to love me with everything. And this is everything. With all your heart, I want your mind, I want your soul and your body. I want you to love me with those things. He tells you straight up. And then he says, I want you to also Love your neighbor as you love yourself. <laughs> if God now legislates love, then love now has indicted this lawyer. Love has brought an indictment against this lawyer predicated on the concept that he's guilty. How? Probably because he's probably never loved the Lord thy God with all of his heart, mind, and soul. But at a very minimum, he is guilty of not loving his neighbor as he loves himself. And this is how I know that he's looking for a loophole 
to get out of it as most lawyers do. And anytime you look for a loophole, it's because you are guilty of something. Now watch this. He says, The Lord, who is love made flesh, says, Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, and soul, and love thy neighbor as thyself. And then the lawyer says to the Lord, Who is my neighbor? <laughs> That's the loophole. He says, you know, what do you believe? What do you wear? What is your theology? I don't know whether I'm going to love you or not until I find out who is my neighbor. So this is supposed to be smart, right? What he is saying is, do I determine it by who lives next door to me? Do I determine it by my ethnicity? Do I determine it by my politics, who my neighbor is? If you don't understand that, then you have never understood the story of the Good Samaritan. Because the story of the Good Samaritan is Jesus' answer to the lawyer's loophole. Jesus looks at him. Watch this, y'all. And he says, who is my neighbor? And Jesus is so cool, he doesn't even answer him. Jesus just says this. He says, and a certain man. <laughs> Jesus says, a certain man went down from Jerusalem. And the very fact that he says he went down from Jerusalem says that he's a Jew. Watch this. To Jericho. And he says he fell among thieves who stripped him and wounded him and left him half dead. Follow me, y'all. He says a Levite passed him by and saw him. A Levite. The Levitical priesthood, the pastors of that day, the religious orthodoxy, those who epitomize the sacraments of the faith, the tenets, the ones who handled the theology for us, passed by this man and looked at him and turned and went away. You mean this guy who the lawyer perceived to be okay who, who seemed to be an okay neighbor, didn't even help him. So let me break this down where it becomes relevant to us. Have you ever been shocked when you were in trouble at who did not help you? The very person that you thought for sure that you knew would be your ride or die. Let me give a disclaimer real quick. Ride or die is an African-American colloquialism that means total commitment. It means uh, to be totally commitment, committed. All right, I'm back. And so you find out that when the heat is on, the brother who said that he would always be there for you acts like he doesn't even know you. He looks at your predicament and crosses by on the other side. Now, isn't it funny? How you can limit love to likeness, only to find out the old Negro adage that everybody who's skin to me ain't really kin to me. So Jesus says, who is your neighbor? Was it the priest? Was it the Levite? Or was it the good Samaritan who got down off his beast and poured in the oil and the wine and set you on his beast and brought you to the innkeeper's house? And all of that help came from somebody that you wouldn't have thought was your neighbor. So God is saying that if you're going to be like him, you have to love like him. You have people, you have to love people who don't think like you, who don't look like you, who don't vote like you, who don't dress like you. And you have to stop trying people before you love them and begin to understand that love has no loopholes in it. So don't dress it up in political clothes. Don't dress it up in religious clothes. Don't dress it up in ethical clothes. Your love is being tested in some areas right now. A demand is being placed on your ability to love. 
your ability to understand, your ability to broaden your perspective beyond your comfort zone. Why? Because there are no loopholes in love. So we have to be bigger than this. We have to stop looking for loopholes to justify our foolishness. We have to stop looking for loopholes to justify our own selfishness. We got to stop looking for loopholes to get out of what God has commanded us to do. So my soul says yes. My mind says yes. Because I know I'm better than this. So Lord. Create in me a clean heart and renew in me a right spirit. Remember, love has no loopholes. So until next time, may the Lord our God bless you and may heaven smile upon you. Grace and peace, everyone. This is Pastor Davis. I pray that the word you heard today not only blessed your life at this particular moment, but I pray that the word you heard has met you at the right time and in the right situation so that you know that you've heard from the Lord Jesus Christ today. And now you have an opportunity to establish a vibrant relationship with Jesus Christ. If you're ready, we encourage you to take that leap of faith and give your life to Jesus Christ. Just simply admit that you're a sinner in need of forgiveness then confess your sins. Thank God for Jesus' death on the cross that paid the price for your sins. Then ask Jesus to be the Lord of your life. Pray this with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I'm sorry for the wrong things I've done. Please forgive me. I believe your son Jesus died on the cross for my sins and rose from the dead. Jesus, come into my heart and be my Lord and my Savior. I surrender my life to you. Now, Father, help me to do your will. And thank you again for saving me. In Jesus' name I pray. If you prayed that prayer, congratulations. God just gave you eternal life. Please let us know by emailing us at the address below and someone will contact you. We look forward to hearing from you. We love you in Jesus' name. God bless you and welcome to the family.